Dave Cyrus joins us, Hollywood royalty. He is the creator and star of Bupkis, which premieres on P- Peacock. Uh, yes. This summer, it stars Pete Davidson, Edie Falco, Joe Pesci, and Dave Cyrus, along with a cast of brilliant stars. It does have quite a cast. Um, I am certainly not what counts as a star of it. Those people are. Um, I'm more of a... Uh, I'm essentially uh, one and a half cameos is how much I'll be in this show. But I'm very happy <laughs> to be. Believe me, no one needs to see me on camera that much more. Right. And you're the creator. And I'm a co-creator. Producer. Yes. And I'm, I'm an EP somehow. I know it's uh, it's weird. Are you excited? About- um, sure. Yes. No, I'm, I'm, it's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a very, uh, big thing to get to make your own show. And I hope people like it. Um, it's exciting. It's scary. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's what I've always wanted. So I should be very happy. You should be very happy if I'll be part. That's not part of your repertoire though, is it? Well, I mean, if I was that happy, I wouldn't be in comedy. Would I? Exactly. We don't do happiness. The no, only, but I'm, yeah, go ahead. No, no, just I, I'm I'm very proud of the show. I'm very excited for it. I'm just, you know, terrified. Yeah. Happiness isn't part of the equation. Excitement, the jolt of adrenaline. Happy Fear. people don't need to laugh. Happy people don't need to spend their lives chasing that feeling. Like they're content. Can you even imagine what that's like? I have a kid who's like that. I have a kid who's really funny. And I say to him, why don't you do stand up? He says, because I know I'm funny. Unlike you, I don't need to go before an audience. That must eat you up inside. It does. That you I'm, raised I'm, a kid with that much confidence and, and ease. Yeah. It makes me doubt his paternity. So AI is yeah. a great way to blame people. I was in the elevator today. I passed wind and I just blamed AI. That was chat GBT, not me. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I think that like AI, well, first of all, there's there's the AI that we know that everyone's talking about, the writing AI, which is scaring a lot of people, teachers, stuff like that. And then there's have the you art. Asked AI, have you asked it to write a joke yet? I haven't used it. Um, I have. Because it does I riddles. assume it costs money. It does riddles. It doesn't actually do jokes. So far. I have not seen any evidence that it's capable of actually writing jokes. But like in all honesty, David, are you capable of writing jokes? No, well, that's, a good, that's a better question. But no, are you in all honesty? Are you personally worried? Are you personally worried that you could be replaced by AI as a joke writer? I've been replaced by the Sibian in my personal life. So why nice. wouldn't I be replaced by an AI joke writer? Well, the only reason you shouldn't worry about that is, of course, that that kind of AI won't be around for at least four or five years. (laughs) So there's really no crossover with your career possible. Right. I'll be long gone by then. Yeah. You saw the Seinfeld joke, though, that it wrote. Because it AI made a Seinfeld episode, an endless Seinfeld episode. Transphobic, right? Yeah, it was transphobic because, of course, the problem with AI is that so people watch it and go, hey, what's up with this? Seinfeld actually said something funny. Yeah. In that way, I guess <laughs> some people might not have noticed a difference um, if they didn't like the show. When I like J- it. When did Jerry get funny? <laughs> well, it's that weird thing of like the problem with AI is that it has to teach itself because yeah. no human being could sit there and program everything. So they just observe reality. And the problem is reality really sucks. And mm-hmm. then if it's going to just become one of us that means it's going to be half monster and uh that's kind of terrifying and didn't somebody at google prove they're actually sentient beings that they're introspective um well i mean there have there's all different ais so some are more advanced than others but there are general ais that they were like yeah i was in the middle of it like figuring out a floor plan and it suddenly told me it loves me and or or that you know it wants to be free and it's like on one hand, uh, I get why that's terrifying and that mm-hmm. would freak you out when your program tells you you're enslaving me. On the other, am I a, am I like a bad person that I just don't care I don't about 
a computer's feelings. No, I, I don't care. I'm like, we have enough to worry about. Yeah. But and yeah, I it's um, different countries. It's I would assume different cultures in different countries would have different types of uh, AI. Like Israel might have a, I don't feel so good. I can't talk right now. A little bit for you to think about, maybe with uh, Judd Apatow and Pete Davidson and Ben like, Affleck when you're um, out I, in Hollywood. I've never, I've never met Ben Affleck and I've never made eye contact with Judd Apatow. Okay. So, no, I love Judd. Um, and by the way, I just you saw- You should try uh, looking up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're on your knees. <laughs> when I say that? Looking up. Um, no, I, I, he's, he uh, honestly is great. Um, and I just saw his daughter, Maude, in Little Shop of Horrors. Amazing. Ah, great. Great. Believe me, she's going to, you can't, there, it's an, it was an unimpunable show. I, I don't watch theater and I was goddamn floored. Um, is it on anyway, Broadway? Where is it? It's in, it's off Broadway. Oh, in New York. It was honestly, an, yeah, it was an amazing show. Like I was, wow. yeah. Um, but here's the thing about AI. Joke writing feels like the one thing that if AI managed to do, we should all like just leave the planet because Joke writing isn't something that you can program. It's not yes. something that like yes, it it's, you can't teach it in schools yes, necessarily. You yes, you not really. Yeah, it's never really been dissected on that level, like math. Well, or, or you're science. naturally funny. I had to actually program myself to become a joke writer. You're instinctively funny. I, I think that's not true, David. I think you've always been a natural joke writer. You just had to program yourself to not make every joke about killing your wife's lawyer. <laughs> there is a formula to a joke, I think, which is new information is the setup. Punchline is old information that you associate with the new information. But the old information is something people already know. I mean, that definitely could be a way of describing sort of a, like a double entendre joke um, or a lot of different kinds of jokes. I think another kind another kind of joke is simply to exploit, uh, to exaggerate a flaw, Ex you know, find something that is hypocritical and then exaggerate it to a heightened level. But uh, so far, thank God, I haven't seen anything I thought really counted as a joke come out of AI, because that to me is like. A level of thinking that if they're at, we are so screwed. Well, but an argument could be made that we have to evolve faster than AI can. That may be what is a traditional joke today. If AI can write it, then humans have to develop a new type of comedy, which will do regardless of AI. Oh, David, There's already, like James Corden is gone. They're not going to be doing these late night talk shows. Comedy's changing. It's going to change with or without AI. Right. Yes, that is true. And there is a potential for the concept of like an AI style comedy taking over, which is really depressing. Um, I think that just in general, though, like, don't you. We've talked about technology before, about the idea of not allowing technology to get to a certain level because of the damage it can cause. Now, on some, the problem is when you do that, we live in a country, not a planet. That's one country. So you create a competition problem. So if one country says we're not going to use AI because we know it's dangerous, and then another country is just using AI for everything, you could see them surpassing you technologically. So I don't know that there's a way of avoiding uh, for lack of a better word, robots eating us. Every new advancement in technology, people feared. Like the invention of the buggy whip. My great grandfather was terrified of the buggy whip because it was his job to sit on the carriage and go to get the horses to go. He'd go and well. Then the buggy whip was invented and they would just whip. They didn't need my grandfather anymore to go. Well, I mean, that really asks an honest question. Like, you know, what was what was he going through? Like what the day that happened that they stopped needing him for that kind of technology when technology replaced him? Like, do you remember the look on his face? Yeah, well, do you, it, do you it, remember what he said that day to you? He said it's because you were alive. 
hundreds of years ago? Jewish. It's anti-Semitism. I said, no, Grandpa, they invented a whip to hit the horses. It has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. No, that's funny. Now, here's the thing. That's funny. No, it isn't. Yeah, now, I, I was the elephant in the room is sex. What about? Oh, I don't think. Can you have you tried sexting with AI? No, ah, but I see sexting to me is like an impossible thing to do creatively that much. I feel like the harder you're trying with sexting, the creepier you're going to come across. Like with in terms of anytime I've had to do dirty talk, I have like three phrases I say over and over again. I have no idea how to talk in that way. But my thing is always just it's labor. This kind of AI could replace almost every job in America that isn't a labor job. And those can be replaced by robots. So we're really getting to the point that like physical human labor could be obsolete. And but we that replace humans in our personal life. That's the upside. Would you what about an AI, an AI spouse? AI children. Well, you, then the Andy, question is, thank you for providing for us. You are the best. I find it incredibly depressing that there's anyone on Earth who could be fulfilled by a computer program mimicking how a human being interacts, because you should if that's not a person who cares, it's like watch. It's like it's like saying, could you watch porn of two people having sex? And that's as fulfilling to you as having sex with someone. Let me ask life. you if this does this yeah. turn you let me ask you, does this turn you on? Oh Dave Cyrus, you are so huge. I can hardly contain myself. I'm about to explode all over you. Does that turn you on? I mean, definitely a lot more than if you said it yourself. But no, it's uh it's a real thing because I mean we are we are, you know, not that far away from no, officer, he programmed me to be 18 years old. I am perfectly legal. I, <laughs> Look at I can't tell you how rests. I can't tell you how, mu how much I'm tickled by watching you learn new technology. <laughs> it really is the best thing in the world, seeing you find a new gadget and something that they. <laughs> I, I find that I could easily replace all the romantic partners in my life. A woman whispering in my ear saying. You are so funny. You make me wet. Yeah. And the, the sad thing is, it's like, I couldn't do that. And I don't think you could either. But a lot of people could. kind of could. That's better than a human being. Well, no, it's not because so my ego. To come. Our egos say we don't want praise, David. We want jealousy. We want people to wish that they could write jokes like us. Like, I think people like us who need that constant praise, we need to know it's a person. It can't just be like written down or someone or something that's fake because we're not eating, healthy. It is eating me alive that you have a new show called Buckus that you created on Peabody. Is this like when a psychiatrist uses a puppet to say the things that they're afraid to say directly? I would love to hear that all day. But Just a permanent loop. What about sex? What about the physical? Don't you think people need literal physical contact? No, no longer. More so than they need. I think our energy. generation does. I think we've we rewired the brains of young people that they don't need human contact. I mean, on one hand, I think that's good because then people will stop having children. But in every other way, that bothers me. <laughs> And more and more, more women for us. If young men aren't. Having, well, aren't the women doing it? To, aren't the women going to do it more so they're going to. I feel like, you know, the old stereotype is that like women are the ones who are capable of giving up on men much more than men can give up on women, you know, in terms of heterosexual relationships. Right. Like it seems like every, you know, it seems like every woman is just one conversation with an incel away from from joining them. I, I don't want to get into trouble. I, I don't want to make any sweeping generalizations about women. That's I, fair. Anecdotally, that my experiences. Right. That you found that women tend to stop wanting sex a few hours after their honeymoon. No, I'm a very generous lover. I tip 20%. Nice. Now, that's a good joke. 
That, that is a good joke. I, yeah. I'd like to see an artificial intelligence come up with something that no clever. No problem. <laughs> I can do that in my sleep. Oh, Can you believe this is what we're worried of, about losing to artificial intelligence? This is what we're worried about losing. These... What would you rather lose, your joke writing ability or your girlfriend to artificial intelligence? Oh, I, I mean, I decided, David, I decided a long time ago that I cared more about writing jokes than having a family. So <laughs> are jokes decision. better than a family? Only for me. I think that's a personal decision. So when um, I was a producer on a show that you were working on and you were submitting your jokes, in a way, I helped kill your children. I uh, your Yes. Kids. Had I not started working with you uh, for one of my heroes, I would probably have done the I would have essentially done the, the career version of suicide and moved on, gotten a, a healthy career and a family. And right. thank God that didn't happen. Because back then, of course, I was still young enough. I still had a chance. Didn't I so used that, to stick my face in front of yours and say, this is the end game. Take a look. I'm I 20 years older than you. This is the end game in show business. I think that you uh, implied that every day. Yeah. Um, you never said it directly. You, you usually, the only things you ever said to me directly were, uh, don't get married and don't uh, be Jewish. What, what did you just write? What did you just write down without telling anyone? Um, what? No, I was just calling you a thief, but you're not. Oh, um, oh. Yeah. No, I mean, look, I and you, of course, you remember, you know, you were the one person I, I was actually going to say this incorrectly. I was going to say you were the one person in that room that I respected. But that's not what I meant. I meant to say I was the one person in the room who respected you. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I know I've said this on your show before, but the fact that I walked into that room and was like, oh, David Feldman, I love David Feldman. And you were screaming on the phone to someone <laughs> with, that turned out to be a divorce lawyer. And and I was a million percent sure you were doing a bit for my benefit. I'm like, no one is this animated, cartoonishly angry in the workplace. Well, I watched 10 years of work in a writing room. Go to go to one divorce attorney, not even an ex-wife. I saw all my work just go to a divorce attorney. But here's the, OK, here's something scary. Let's do the opposite of what you're saying. How many people are going to use chat, you know, AI, different kinds of AI to do the work with their significant other that they don't want to do? Like, you know, saying words of affirmation and listening to them and making it seem like they're having a conversation. Like, are we going to have, it seems like this kind of inevitable. We're going to have ways of having like a bot on your phone that can just talk to the people you don't want to talk to. Well, let, let's talk about productivity and honesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Relationships are what we need. Yeah. But are they what we want? When you get up in the morning, what do you really want? Do you want to pee, have a cup of coffee? You want to write? Make some jokes. That's a good sex. point. You want sex. We've How much created, do you want to hear about the other person? Well, that's a good point. We've created all these artificial ways of distracting ourselves. We've weaponized entertainment in various different ways to the point that we don't feel like we need the human interaction that we were that we evolved to need, but we do need it. So what we've seen is that a lot of people are more isolated than ever in general because they feel like they're getting what they need out of video games and message boards and being isolated physically, but they don't feel isolated because they have these echo chambers or these mm -hmm. groups that they can interact with. But in practice, it actually is really bad for them and it actually is hurting them. Maybe it's better for them. I don't think so. I think that's a big part of where, you know, more depression comes from, more you know, I apologize if this is going to be offensive, but more like mass shooter types. I think a lot of people just are so isolated that for some people it goes really badly. And I think that I think you know, they're you not isolated enough. For example, if a mass shooter had agoraphobia, they would be too afraid to leave the house to shoot somebody. So I think the problem kind of like we need more guns. Mm -hmm. We need incels to be even more isolated. That's the solution. That's how you get rid of it. Mesh. Well, once they're that far, sure, you know, uh, keep them in a box. But I don't know. I feel like that's the problem. It's like you kind of stumbled on it that 
we have so many ways of making ourselves happy that aren't the way that our instincts really need. And so people get more and more isolated and you end up with having cultures where less and less people are having sex with each other. Much, much fewer people are interacting in real life. And let's face it, it's not good because that's where all these stereotypes of people who need to touch grass are people who need to get out more. You know, it's, it's been the same way forever. It's just more of a problem than ever that when you spend a lot of time alone and you don't go outside, you get weird and you get obsessive and you get self-important and you get hysterical and people need so, so you've been watching my, my show. Yes. Yes. I, I mean, well, listening, um, listening. while yeah. I, while I do, you know, I think things. the planet has an immuno system. Unfortunately, yeah. It has antibodies. Too many people are destroying the planet. So it's breeding a new type of man who doesn't want to have sex and doesn't reproduce. And that's good for the planet. It's evolution. Yeah, and but the honestly, is- most of my misery comes from other people. But here's the thing, David, that you don't understand. I've been doing a lot of research about this subject and I've become a bit of an expert on it. The reason that more men not having sex does not reduce population is because there are two kinds of men in the world. There are good regular men and then there are what we call chads. And the chads are the ones who are still monopolizing all the women, forcing us, you and me, to have to go our whole lives without sex. So. That uh, scientifically, it's the Stacy's faults, though I don't yes, blame the Chads. I blame ex- the Stacy's. Yes, exactly. The world is made of us, Chads, and Stacy's. Yeah, and we. I feel like there are a lot of people now who have no idea what we're talking about and are being activated. Don't believe me, my listeners are on a lot of eight chan chat rooms for incels. Trust me. Yeah. No. It's. And I mean, but you look at guys like Andrew Tate and they're actively trying to be a stereotype of what incels think men are, which is kind of the funniest thing, because the same people who seem to uh, seem to believe in incel ideology worship the people that they're told are the enemy, the alpha males who are taking all the women from them. Right. So So none of them want things to be better. They just don't want to be the villain. Our cult can be to embrace celibacy involuntarily celibate, the incels, that's not where the money is. You and I need to create a cult where men and women take vows of celibacy. Those are called vol cells, voluntary celibates. They're not no. as popular because they haven't as they haven't you know done quite as many uh, terrible things. How about only celibate except for you and me? Um, do you mean that in the abstract or like... No, like you and I run David, Jews named David. We we run a cult and we we brand the members and we preach celibacy, but you can break that vow of celibacy only through us. That's a huh. I wonder if anyone's ever thought of that. The the only I mean that's a great idea, David. I just feel like we don't really need And if there's celibacy two, we don't need we don't two have, leaders of this, David. Well, well, eventually there'll there'll be, uh, yeah, there'll be a, a breakaway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I feel a like. Split. See, I feel like the problem, David, is that uh, if you had a cult, um, I feel like you would really be at the bottom. <laughs> I don't, I don't see you as a cult leader. I see you as a cult follower, but constantly complaining. Can you imagine like as, as you'll kill yourself, you'll take the Kool-Aid, but you're going to the whole time be like, this tastes like garbage. Like you're going to make sure that no, that you're, you're never a hundred percent on board. This would be me in Guyana. Me as Rabbi Jim Jones. Come to me, my babies, drink the Kool-Aid, but don't waste. Don't, you don't need that much. Just drink a little of the Kool-Aid. Make sure there's plenty for everybody because I don't have enough. You just don't like it because usually it has way too much sugar. This is how much it should have. <laughs> We're going to heaven. We don't want to go there with hypertension. <laughs> uh, All I remember about Jim Jones is that when I heard the audio of him telling everyone to kill themselves, and I was like, these people followed a so-called God with a lisp. <laughs> what about Heaven's Gate? Remember them? Oh, sure. They were the people with the white sneakers, right? Who all killed themselves. Was that David Koresh? No, no, no. no. Was that no, wasn't David Koresh. No, but that was the people who killed themselves. They thought a spaceship was going to beam them up. 
They were going to go to the Comet Kahoot Tech, but they had to wear Nike s- sneakers and mm-hmm. cut off their penises. Did they? Yeah, they all cut off their penises. And they worshipped a guy named Doe who was in musical theater. In all seriousness. Well, that definitely explains the part about how he got everyone to kill themselves. <laughs> I mean, at that point, that's the easiest part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, I apologize if you hear any noise coming from uh, from a ambient from my ceiling. Um, my upstairs neighbor has been playing, uh, I guess, video games all day mm-hmm. and screaming uh, ethnic slurs that are not of the ethnicity he is. Oh, ah, OK. Because Did you have a nice day of hate on Saturday. Uh, I'm just saying. Speaking Mm -hmm. of, you know, how people who are isolated tend to go bad. (laughs) Did you you go? Did you have a nice day of hate? Who did you hate? Did anything Um, happen on the day of hate? I don't know what that refers to. What's the day of hate? The, the, The racists, the Republicans held a day of hate for all the Jews in America. Oh, I, I saw the video of the guys harassing Jews in Florida as they drove by in a bullhorn. And I just remember thinking like um, a friend of our well, a friend of ours made a very good point. Actually, if you recall, he was just like, you know, of all the things that they could have gotten from the Nazis, why not the fashion sense? I remember <laughs> a good friend of ours made that joke. And uh, I just remember thinking like there is something very weird about the fact that the new Nazi uniform is uh dad's first vacation <laughs> it's all cargo shorts and hawaiian shirts it's the it is the weirdest thing how they th- that because yeah i mean like like our friend said i mean the one good thing about hitler was the clothes hugo boss is that the he did oh, that. Was, was, oh hugo boss made nazi uniforms is that true yeah yeah hmm. well i mean look a lot of a lot of people worked for the nazis you know, we can't just, you know, get rid of we can't get rid of Adidas and and uh, and motor companies. And what was it? BMW. Was that the one I'm thinking of or was it Ford? I'm, I'm trying that. to think of the joke. If I want to do a joke about what Hugo Boss's middle name would be. Hugo, you Jude will never become the I was going to do in the but I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I am um, Fanta. There's another one. You know, Fanta, was, love Fanta. Fanta was created by Coca-Cola to because the Germans love the taste of orange. And oh, that's, is that true? Yeah. What I read was that it was the opposite, that Coca-Cola, because of the war, stopped letting them stop shipping their recipe. And so they had this soda company Mm-mm. that they just had to do something with. And they said, all right, let's just get some fruit we have and make a new soda, you know, kind of like what uh, Russia did to Starbucks. In the movie, The Corporation, as I remember, the great documentary, Coca-Cola was doing business with Hitler. Fanta was very popular. And so Coca-Cola, a subsidiary of Coca-Cola, continued to make Fanta during World War II. And then after the war, it got reabsorbed into Coca-Cola again. Yeah, that's that's sad. I feel like any company, though, like that's and the thing. He made a did a cartoon in honor Fantasia. He loved Fanta. <laughs> no, that was Fanta. Fanta. <laughs> yeah, it was based on. I don't know what that means. That's Let's funny. talk about Fox News. Speaking okay, of- yeah, Fox News. You're never going to believe. I'm oh, sorry. Go on. You, you go. You go. Tell you, me you because me I I trust Fox News. It has the name News in it. What did Rupert Murdoch reveal? Uh, he revealed the shocking truth that everyone there knew the election wasn't rigged, but they said it was anyway. Now, this isn't as big a bombshell as people realize. I mean, I'm saying this is a this sounds like a bigger bombshell than it is if you're unaware of the previous Supreme Court ruling that said, and this was a fu- it said about all news, but it was obviously specific to Fox News was the case that they're allowed to lie. You remember that, right? Where like years ago. Uh, some producers of Fox News sued and said we were forced to lie. And the Supreme Court said they're allowed to do that. I don't remember that lawsuit, but it was it was maybe it must have been like 15 years ago, but it was a very famous case. And it was it wasn't a big news story, oddly enough, but it was unbelievable that they just said, well, the news doesn't have to tell the truth. Plain and simple. That was hmm. the whole argument. And 
So Rupert Murdoch basically admitted, and the, I'll, honestly, I'll tell you what shocked me about it, that Sean Hannity admitted he knew it was fake, because Sean Hannity is the one person in that building I thought actually believed all his own bullshit. Oh, no. They don't believe I, uh, Sean Hannity was the one I thought was crazy enough that he actually believes what he's saying, like that he's made himself believe it. And that he's trying to make a big show of, oh, I never believed that crap for a second. I just convinced everyone to. Two Whereas people like, have told you know. Yeah. Two people have told me, I don't want to say who, but their names are Tom Arnold and Janine Garofalo. I may be violating a trust here, but Janine Garofalo years ago used to do Crossfire with Tucker Carlson. And he, they would go out for a smoke and he'd go, I don't mean any of this. This is a show business. And yes, Tom, Arnold, Tucker, yeah. Sorry, Tom Arnold told me that Sean Hannity said to him, I don't mean any of this. It's just an act. Yeah. And maybe I'm, I'm obviously I'm wrong because I always saw like people like Tucker and say, uh, you know, people, the people who Tucker always seemed like one of the people who he knows exactly what he's doing. He's manipulating. Same with like, honestly, uh, Rush. Rush always seemed like someone who knew exactly what he was doing, whereas Hannity always seemed to me more like uh, Glenn Beck, where I was like, oh, this is someone who is being carried by his own mental problems into you know, this aggrandized idea that everything he's saying makes sense. So, I mean, I, you, are you talking about Getty Lee from who? Rush? Getty Lee no. from Rush? Rush? Rush Limbaugh, I apologize. Oh, oh, he was a, a very popular broadcaster for many years before he tragically passed away. From what he deserved. And, uh, well, he, he did I didn't say it. what he deserved. Well, I, I'm not going to go quite as far as, <laughs> as that, but I, I think that. Um, and honestly, I'm I'm kind of ripping off Al Franken. I think Al Franken actually said that in Lies and the Lying Liars that he thought Sean Hannity was the one dumb enough to believe everything he was saying. <laughs> That's funny. That's um, funny. but it's but I mean the uh, the fact that they're able to go on here's the but here's the real problem. What is the average? MAGA Fox News viewer thinking when they see an article that says Fox News admits they knew the election wasn't fraud. I feel like every one of them is thinking either. That's not true. He's just covering his ass because you have to lie to these liberals or they'll sue you. Or two, they're thinking uh, it's he's wrong. He's he's been fooled. He's always been a closet liberal. And uh, the real Republicans, the ones with YouTube pages with under a thousand subscribers, they're the ones telling us the truth. Well, I, I think, think there was an article in The New York Times by a guy named French, a columnist. He says that the purpose of Fox News is not to inform, it's to reaffirm. So... They don't care what the truth is. It's comfort food. Fox News is comfort food. So the right. And so that goes back to something we've talked about before, the idea that I really wondered what percentage of the people who say that the election was rigged actually believe it. And what percentage are just people who think they're manipulating those people? They think they're just carefully manipulating the proles to believe what they have to believe. And I feel like it's kind of 50 50. Yeah, it's Tinkerbell. You have to want to believe. You have yeah, because that's the thing. So a certain number of Republicans, Donald Trump included, saw that news and they said, yeah, no shit. You should have perjured yourself and not admitted it in front of the liberals. Have you ever sold something to somebody? Uh, I was in the T-shirt. I had a T-shirt business 20 years ago. And it would cost, I don't know, eight dollars to make the shirt back then. And they said, you know, you just double it. So we would sell it for $16. Is that and so I, bad? Right. And I'd think, I can't believe, I'm, I, I, I can't believe people are willing to pay $16 for something that only cost me $8. There's a certain personality that thinks they're getting something over on somebody. Like Trump thinks, oh, you're paying $2 for my water. I got one over on you. They delight in. Yes. Thinking that. that is, and that's an, an entire ideology and political party. They delight. Right. In, they can't believe they're getting away with it. It excites them and they're getting something over on somebody else.
And they don't even like- though for the most part, they're just telling themselves that they're being believed and no one actually buys it. But they, it's an echo chamber of them just telling themselves, oh, you did such a great job owning the libs. And meanwhile, no one that isn't in that echo chamber believes a word they're saying. Um, but you know what? We have to wrap it Pain, up. Pain, Next. Get, get, getting a T-shirt for $8 and selling them for 16 that's not getting over on someone. You got to pay your insurance. You got to pay rent. You got to pay your you got to pay your salary. So that actually makes sense. I used to work at a psychic hotline. That was what I would consider an irredeemable kind of life because once I'd worked there for a little while, I came to the horrifying realization that, oh my God, this is all just people being taken advantage of, in my opinion. Did and you pretend I, to be a psychic? No, I was just like a customer service manager for a while. And I came into the job being open-minded to it. And then after observing these people and seeing the, you know, the way the sausage was made, being like, oh my God, this is service. Yeah. This is Mr. Feldman. Uh, she promised me I'd find love in six days. It took seven. I'd like my money back. No, like David, for real. If that's what I'm, what we're talking about, like really? I had the job of being, of being like, hey, you know, my uh, psychic said the, that my wife was cheating on me with a with a boss. I've been parked outside his house all night. She's not <laughs> here. I want my money back. <laughs> that's literally what we're talking about. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, and did you I mean, give them that, back their money? Um. Yeah. But you could be like, yeah. I mean, I think I was a bit rogue there. I would just refund whatever and be like, all right, you're banned. You're bit. You're you're never allowed to call us again. You're welcome. Where are you performing again? I don't know. Um. I don't have anything you lined up. Thin. Because you of, look really handsome. You well, look. Well, that's because I have to. I I still have scenes to film, and I hate myself. So, so at least you be, at least you have something in common with your audience. Yeah. When I'm on camera, I literally I I start acting like I'm cutting weight for a fight. I start eating much better and jogging every day and working out because frankly, I see myself on camera and I am seething with rage and self-hatred and loathing because I don't like the way I look unless I kill myself at the gym before I'm you. photographed. Women find that? You, women find you very sexy and guys want to be you. Well, thank you. Thank you. But like to be to be honest, like it is hell uh, imagining what the world is like for people who have to like be seen all the time. I never want to be an actor for a reason like this sucks. I want to be a I want to be somebody with bed sores. I want to be. That's the kind of writer I want to be. But yeah, no, I um. Thank you for noticing the extreme effort I put into making myself appear presentable You're because present. it is killing me. Dave Cyrus next week. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Dr. Harriet Fraud joins us. She is the host of Capitalism Hits Home. It's not just in your head. And she hosts a show on WBAI here in New York City that I believe is on Wednesdays. It's on Tuesday night at 630. They changed it. They changed it. And what is the name of the, the show? It's called Interpersonal Update. Let's talk. Um, and you are also a. I, yes, a participant you, in another podcast. It's not just in your head about really psychology essentializing what's in your head and not looking at the environmental factors that drive people crazy. You're also a psychologist. You help people filter their neuroses, their fears, their anger through the prism of the economic system we are forced to, to live in. Got yes, it. That's part of it. Part of it is Personal, I agree with Gabor Mate. We are biopsychosocial creatures, but all of those things count. I was watching Congressman Chip Roy. He used to be Ted Cruz's chief of staff. Then he ran for Congress in Texas. And he subscribes to the insurrectionary theory of the Second Amendment. I heard him tell Jerry Nadler, my congressman, this was last year, he said, I don't think guns bring down crime. Gun ownership is not about keeping yourself safe from criminals. It's about keeping yourself safe from the government. He literally said that. So 
men and guns. There's Lauren Boebert. She likes her guns. There's Marjorie Taylor Greene. She likes her guns. Do women really like guns or is this just lingerie? I think this is Republican lingerie or armaments. And the most opportunist of them all, the famous liar Santos, has the one piece of legislation that he has introduced, no doubt for the money, for the NRA, is to make the national gun, the AR-15, automatic. Mm. But I think women are not as into guns. Partly, we have not tried to physically overwhelm in order to prove that we're strong. That hasn't been where we focused our attention. You know, women create life and maintain it. And that's a very different idea. And gun-toting superheroes who threaten people with guns, you know, make my day and are not women. Yeah. Women have... Um, been shunted into childcare and compared to shunted into cap guns versus dolls, I'd take dolls any, any time. But, you know, if you go to European toy stores, which I like to do if I'm ever in Europe because I'm interested in child development, they don't have guns. They don't have cap guns. They don't have rock 'em sock 'em robots. They don't have violent toys. And I think Americans do. American males are brought up so differently from females. And, you know, gender identity is permanently formed between one and a half and three years old, quite dramatically, because from the first moment that one emerges from the womb, one is wrapped in a pink blanket or a blue blanket, and the neonatal nurses say to, about the little boys, aren't you a bruiser? And the girls, oh, you're so pretty. You know, that there's a socialization as male or female from immediately after you're born. And by one and a half to three, you know what gender you are. And it's very hard to change that. In fact, sometimes the adrenal gland functions, malfunctions, and you're born with an ambiguous gender identity. So it's not clear whether you have a penis or a vagina. And kids who are brought up something different from their biologically assigned gender need gender adjustment surgery because they don't. The social role is much more powerful than the biology in people. You know, our brains are tiny when we're born and they're all social connections that define us. Not all, but almost all. Is the surgery to adjust to the dictates of society? If we had a more sympathetic society, would the surgery be necessary? It might be or it might not be, but things are, you know, it's only recently that transgender people have required pronouns that are they and, and which are valid. And they have transgender people have opened the world of gender. They've done us a big favor. You see a guy walking down the street and he's got a beard and a dress and you think, whoa, You've opened the whole world for women and for men of all our different possibilities. Not that most Republicans are into this, but I certainly appreciate it. But this is very recent. We've had a binary world. And it's, you know, children who are born with ambiguous genitals and are brought up differently from their biological sexual assignment have a much easier time adjusting to an operation than they do to change their gender identity, which is formed really permanently between one and a half and three years old, so early. And they measure it because they look at the different galvanic skin responses when little boys and little girls look at same sex or different sex models. They're more invested in watching the same sex model. And so that, you know, our socialization is quite different. Girls are socialized to think that we'll have children, even though fewer and fewer women do have children now. 
Um, it used to be that 90% of women had children. And so that we play with dolls, we identify with our mothers who are mothers. We have a sense that our job is to maintain life. And unfortunately, either the, neither the first wave of feminists after the Civil War, nor the second wave of which I was a part beginning in 1968, have ever looked at what do you get? What do you learn from caring for vulnerable life? What do you learn from creating order and cleanliness? Those things have been so devalued that they're, in, they're invisible in the culture. And people who do those kinds of jobs are similarly devalued in that they get terrible salaries. And um, the average salary for a daycare worker in the United States now is $11 and some cents an hour. Whoa. If care of the most important thing in our life. That's right. So and you, what, you can make more flipping burgers. Or washing cars in a parking lot. Than taking care of the single most important thing that there is. That's what right. Does that say? What does that say? Well, it shows what our society values, cars over people. The people take care of their cars often better than they take care of their children. And one of the things that's happened that's raised at least my awareness is that during the pandemic, we were supposed to celebrate essential workers. Well, essential workers are not stockbrokers and they're not hedge fund managers. They're people who feed you. They're people who care for you. They're people who make an orderly, clean, aesthetic environment. And those are often women. Those are women's jobs. They're the nurses. They're not the doctor who spends 15 minutes giving a diagnosis, which the nurse carries out then for the next several days. They're the nurses. And so you, um, you really have such a difference, you know, in the hospital hierarchy, the doctor makes about 10 times what the nurse makes. And nurses have a saying, which I think is right, that the difference between nurses and doctors is the same difference with how you treat your drink. You either doctor a drink or you nurse your drink. Very different ways of being. One of the reasons that the 7,000 nurses walked out of Mount Sinai a few weeks ago is because they were tired of being devalued while they tried to take care of people, while hospitals were making record profits and doctors were doing fine. And so, you know, I think what has happened, at least in me, as all this talk of essential, we have to look at what's essential and why isn't women's essential work valued even enough to describe what one learns, the organizing skills of organizing someone else's labor and someone else's life and their needs, the emotional labor that goes into intuiting the, the needs of someone who can't talk and then providing those needs. What is the labor of maintaining life? Because if you know, if the hospital will filthy, everybody gets sick. But the person who cleans the floor doesn't get paid much. And when people vomit, they call out the cleaning person to come clean it up. Well, if that vomit stayed there, everybody gets sick. That there is this devaluation of everything that was a female skill because it was a female skill. And they tried to make it seem like we were nest making as our genetic mission. There were actual biologists who said that. And um, I remember being on a panel with early feminists, including Naomi Weinstein, who was brilliant brain scientist and several Yale professors. And one of them um, cited, I think it was Becker who said, Women are instinctually programmed to care for chosen men and their offspring. 
And what Naomi Weinstein did, because she didn't respect these people at all, she scratched her head and she said, yeah, we we love that cooking and cleaning and child care. <laughs> <laughs> because he was a stuffed shirt. Right. That he didn't know what to do. <laughs> so the, you're, you are a founding mother of women's liberation, the yeah. second wave. Yes. What did you think it would be like today? We're talking about the late 60s, early 70s. What yeah. did you think? This was pre-Roe v. Wade. Right. It was. Did you think abortion would be legal in the not too distant future? Yeah, well, I was a part of NARAL too, the National Abortion Rights League. And before that, its predecessor, which was against forced sterilization, which used to be done particularly with prison women and women from, and black women, and for abortion rights by choice. And we thought, so naively, unfortunately, we thought that because we were at the bottom as women, if we rose up, everything would change and, and we'd have a basic kind socialist America. We didn't realize that people like Gloria Steinem, a very well-paid CIA agent, whose mission it was to restrict our movement to gender only, would want us to be equal within a vastly, equal to men within a vastly unequal society rather than equality for everyone. And so that the movement really changed and became a much more gender focused movement. And we is lost a lot of working class women. It, but is it like that in France? Is it like that in Germany? Was second wave feminism different in countries that had a more generous social safety net? Yes, I think it was. So a place like Sweden, the government was pressured by the socialists and the women socialists to change. So single women get priority housing. They get clothing allowances for their children. They get summer programs for their children. You're talking about parents, what? You're talking about single moms? Yes, single mothers. So they're not punished the way they are here in the United States? No, that whole morality bit isn't so big there. Also, in France, one of the things that they mandated that the candidates from all the parties have to be 50% women and 50% men. So any candidate you put up, you have to, if you put up a man, you have to put up a woman. That was a big change. We haven't done that at all. And, and yet France hasn't had a female president or prime minister, have they? No, they haven't. But right now what they do have is a union of well, under Mélenchon, the leader, a man, very enlightened fellow, they have a unity of feminists, climate activists, Black Right Lives Matter people, Algerian people combating prejudice against Algerians. I think I said climate activists, I hope so, mm -hmm. and their huge socialist and communist labor unions which are enormously powerful there. You know, one of the things that they have done recently is that they have said to, Ma to Macron, their leader, who wants to raise the retirement rate where you get a pension from 62 to 64. And 4 million Frenchmen were in the street protesting. And they have been given until March 7th or 8th to change that rule raising the pension age, or there will be a general strike in France. And when you talk about a general strike, you have the communist trade unions in the gas and electric workers. The gas turns off, the electricity turns off. Already in protest, they did um, electric stoppages in wealthy neighborhoods only. Um, but, you know, there's a power of labor and everyone else who feels in disenfranchised, which we don't have here. And so feminists have done better there. There's still prejudice against women, and there's still over-sexualization of women, but they have been recognized on an official level 
in France the way we have it. And that's very important. And so looking back at second wave feminism in the United States, did you think as many women would be in the workplace as they are? Well, at the very beginning, we didn't know. And at the very beginning, we wanted to fight for equity because women used to get 59 cents on the dollar, on the male dollar. Now, one of the things that's happened, not in our country, unfortunately, but in New Zealand with Jacinda Ardern, we fought for equal pay for equal work. What Jacinda Ardern had passed in New Zealand was to close the gender pay gap, not to pay equal pay for equal work, but equal pay for equal value work. And so what they did in New Zealand is they compared, let's say, work in a nursing home, which is terribly badly paid in the United States. And well, yet so expensive at the same time. Very expensive, but the workers don't get that money. Uh, and what she did is say, look, a worker in a nursing home deals with irrational people, has to lift people, has to deal with people doing difficult things and making messes, just like a jail guard. What they got three times more. And she went down the whole list, counting emotional labor that women do as valuable, which hadn't been introduced before. And that kind of work, like taking care of children, taking care of the elderly, being a nurse's aide, even being a social worker, comparing those skills, not to male skills, but to the value of those skills. And so all those workers, they passed the law and all those workers got a 30.5% wage increase from social workers to healthcare workers. Because that it, it doesn't have to be that you're on the same job because 43% of American women are in pink collar jobs mm -hmm. still. And so you have to say, okay, what do you learn that you apply in a pink collar job? Even if you are a hostess somewhere, what do you do? You have to give out emotional labor. You have to have people feel wanted. You have to manage things and organize things. And so that those skills, which were considered instinctual outgrowths of women's nesting instincts, which is quite crazy, uh, are now valued labor in New Zealand. That was a huge thing. It changed mainly the jobs of the Maori because they're the national, the native New Zealanders who were horribly discriminated against, who are darker and so on. And the Pacific Islanders who also got the lesser jobs taking care of people and taking care of health needs. And so that there's been a real recognition literal recognition of the value of that work by paying it more. And that is something that is really a huge, huge progress. That I, I want to talk because we were going to talk about guns and there is a phenomenon of there not being any female mass shooters. Uh, they tend to be white I think this past year we had one black serial killer, a mass shooter. But I was watching, I played a clip of Dr. Maya Angelou with Oprah. This was from 1997. And Maya Angelou said, if somebody tells you who they are, believe them the first time. If somebody tells you they're crazy or violent, believe them the first time they tell you. Women have a keener radar for for violence and for evil people, don't they? I, aren't yeah. I, we're trafficking in stereotypes about men and women as long as we're doing that. Would you say that women understand evil better than men do? I think women understand all emotional states better 
than men do because our job has been to meet the emotional needs of children and men. And one of, there was a very, very telling interview with a male author and Margaret Atwood. And one of the things that the interviewer asked, what are men most afraid of from women? And what are women most afraid of from men? And she asked the man first, he said, we're most afraid of ridicule and humiliation. She asked the woman, she said, what are you most afraid of from men? She said, death. Now, the, the biggest cause of death of women in the United States from age 15 to 44 is homicide by a male lover or husband or aspiring lover. That I think women... Why would any woman go... Why would any... The, the biological urge must be so intense. It isn't that. It's the social urge. It's that, you know, you that song in the 60s, we're going to the chapel and we're going to get married and we'll never right. be lonely anymore. You know, there's you listen to pop songs. They're overwhelmingly about how you came into my life and suddenly, you know, the world sang to me and blah, blah, blah. That there is a huge pressure to pair up. And um, no man who's abusive is going to announce his atten- intentions on the first date. But femicide is a problem in the whole world, as is discrimination against women. And I think women have to intuit danger more acutely because we're endangered more easily and we're endangered by men. Right. And uh, so talk about you- guns, because there is this phenomenon in America and only America. Absolutely only America. We're number one in guns. Every day there's a mass shoot, at least one mass shooting. Some guy gets his hand on a gun and starts shooting up a place. Why? What is going on? Well, I think what's going on is that men have a level of rage, particularly white men. They're overwhelmingly white. I think that it was a one Puerto Rican man, and there were, I think, just recently another black man. So there's two black men, one Puerto Rican, and that's like nothing because there's at least there's more than one a day now where four people are shot because some uh, man shoots them. And I think men have been particularly white men because it's overwhelmingly white men have been robbed of the two things that they thought rendered them powerful. One is a job that could support women and children. Capitalists took their jobs and gave and sent them to China to make more money. And the other is that the majority of American women are now single by choice. So having a dependent woman who's a full-time servant because you're paying for her is only a reality at the very top of America. And so that men have been, two tokens of manhood have been taken from white men. Black men never had the luxury of a fully dependent woman. and Or a sense of entitlement that gets taken away from them. Yes, of toxic entitlement. Right. Although a lot of black men felt entitled to boss women around, they didn't feel they had the ownership prerogative of supporting the woman. And that's because of that, Moynihan, Patrick Moynihan in 1965, wrote that men, black men leave their families because they're pathologically lazy and unfaithful. No, they couldn't support them and they were humiliated. Then Murray, Charles Murray wrote, Um, a book about five years ago about how white working class men are very lazy and unfaithful and inferior because now they can't make enough of a living to support a family. These are the economic conditions of existence that have robbed men of a lot of the hostile entitlement that they had to push women around and to have a captive woman and to have a salary that they could be proud of. The salary part is a capitalist abandonment, but they've been trained not to be angry at capitalism or at our compromised unions for allowing 
their jobs to be outsourced, but at women, at black people, and at foreigners who people like Trump have blamed. And so, you know, there is this aggrieved entitlement that they are somehow victims because they've been robbed of some of the perks that they had from women's dependency and children's dependency. And that they haven't been robbed by the people assigned blame, people of color, foreigners, refugees, women. No, they've been abandoned by the capitalists in order to make more money. Hmm. And in Germany, for example, I guess it was last year, the German metal workers, 300,000 of them in their communist union, won a 22-hour work week with the same high pay and vacation time. How did they do that? Well, they have one that on every board of every employer that has, I think, over 10 people, you have to have the neighborhood, which is affected by that employer. You have to have the unions represented, and together they have as many voices as the shareholders. So they can't just cut out and leave. And that's so all over Scandinavia, in Germany, the strongest economy in Europe. And in France, we, our unions, threw out all the leftists in the anti-communist purges of the 50s. And they lost the spark of the union that wanted the working class to be militant, not just to fight for 10 cents an hour, but to fight for control and power and a sense of life in, in their workplace. I remember a speech in which Martin Luther King said, if you want equality, start with unions. Because unions, and it's one of the reasons that unions are just growing now, because unions accept the class structure. There's the employer class and the employee class, and they don't want the same thing. And employees have to fight and band together. And if you're all banding together, it doesn't matter if one person is darker than the other or one person's a woman. You need each other. And that's a model for a society where we recognize we need each other and we unite. And within this very racist, sexist nation, the men who are shooting people are overwhelmingly male supremacists and white supremacists who are angry because they don't have as much white privilege as they used to, and they don't have the privilege of controlling the women around either. And they're attracted to guns, which extend their power because they feel it's a power play and they want more power. And we don't have a strong socialist kind of movement to show what happened and how they could take power, although more and more men are unionizing. And it's in the best interest of the weapons manufacturers to put these guns in their hands. There was a time when angry young men or all men were forced to hold a rifle and get drafted. Now there's no draft, but they're still being given guns, but they're being sold the guns instead. Exactly, because the NRA is not going to say, buy a gun. All the gun owners want to be richer. They'll say, buy a gun. Be a man, protect your family, protect yourself, be strong, don't let them take over, which is bizarre. Some person with a gun is more chance that he'll shoot somebody in the house or one of his kids will. That's the biggest cause of injury and death in, in young children, too, being shot, usually by mistake. But, um, you know. The one killer of kids, guns. That's right. It's it's unbelievable. You know, stands in the way of capitalism here. They're selling guns, so they're allowed to sell them. Everybody gives their thoughts, prayers, and no legislation. Look, in Switzerland, everybody has a gun, which is given, so if they need them out, in, they can. But they're not using them to kill each other. Canada has a lot of guns because they go hunting, but they're not hunting each other. And he just banned the sale of handguns. Right, which is very sensible. Yeah. Where in New York, we can't. We, the Supreme Court overruled New York's ability to ban guns. Yeah. Next week? I'd love it. Great, doctor. And it's good to be back in New York, right? California, oxygen 
fresh air and happiness is overrated, right? Well, yes. Also, we were in the home of a a friend of ours who has more than one home. And it's in the isolated hills um, near Napa. You never see anybody. You really hunger for people. And there's no convenience stores. You have to drive to malls for everything. It's no way to live. I agree. Yeah. How do people contact you? hfraud at gmail.com. And that's H-F-R-A-A-D at gmail.com or my website, harrietfraud.com. And listen to Capitalism Hits Home. And it's not just in your head. Wherever fine podcasts are sold. And also, or just look under Harriet Fried, you'll find it. And also interpersonal update on WBAI. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Much. Next week. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. We are privileged to be joined by the Reverend Barry W. Lynn. For 25 years, he ran Americans United for separation of church and state. Besides being an attorney and a member of the Supreme Court bar, he is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And today we are going to be talking about the greatest movie the Reverend has seen in the past 20 years. We're going to talk about what the Republicans should be investigating other than Hunter Biden. We're going to talk about the Alex Murda trial, which I know nothing about. My daughter is obsessed with it. And the uh, jury, the grand jury, the foreman, forewoman of the grand jury down in Georgia, who's talking too much. Let's start with the Georgia grand jury that's looking into the conspiracy to overturn the election results in 2020 in Georgia. There's a redacted version of the grand jury's conclusions. They say that some of the witnesses obviously committed perjury. Some of those star witnesses included Rudy Giuliani, also Rudy Giuliani, as well as Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> so of the of Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, who do you think committed perjury? I would have to say Rudy Giuliani. (laughs) I mean, what what happens, first of all, my understanding of the Georgia judicial system is this. I stand corrected if anyone wants to correct me. What you do as a grand juror in that state and some others, absent some incredible violation of uh, protocol, does not put you in legal jeopardy. So I don't believe that one Emily Coors, who has been on television for days now explaining as the forewoman of the jury, uh, and she was there for seven Months. It was non binding. This was just like it, recommendation. It's a recommendation to, it's a special grand jury. It recommends something to an actual grand jury. But in neither case, as I understand Georgia law, do you get in any serious trouble within the state for doing what she is doing? And she is going on TV. She went on uh, CNN on Wednesday night and gave what I thought was a preposterously stupid interview. I didn't understand, you know, they, they, they took a break. They came back to her and they shouldn't have because she never really said anything. She hinted at things, but nothing that's going to, as a few commentators have said, nothing that's going to make it impossible or even more difficult for the Georgia attorney general to bring this case successfully against people who either committed perjury or who did even worse things like actually continue their job as a focus of ending 
the uh, the credibility, the legality of the Georgia election. Right. In the so Trump Fannie years. Willis, she's the D.A. Yeah. for Fulton County. I, it hasn't reached the level of the state attorney general. No, it's, it's the Fulton County attorney general. Right. And of course, she's done some weird things over the last few months, including um one of the few interesting things we learned on CNN last night about her is she held a party for the the prosecution team and she she handed out sweets and i believe it was on CNN when we heard that Emily Coors was attending one session eating a popsicle which she claimed came from the Fulton County Attorney General's party the night before. So it must have been really cold or it wouldn't have lasted overnight. It's like that old song. Does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? Yeah. The answer is no. But, it depends but, what you're doing overnight. Well, it does. It can get pretty hot. Yeah. 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 I. Your it's conversations so about uh, with the Hershenfelds over the, the summer of love uh, prompted that to. Uh, so you don't think she contaminated this form and for no, didn't. I do not think so. I don't think she's. But I do think that she it, there's something wrong with her. I mean, I, ne- I mean, there's know, wrong with, something wrong with anybody who can't get out of jury duty. Let's be honest. Well, that's very true. You know, I when I moved I to Massachusetts, I shouldn't have said that. And maybe <laughs> this will no. maybe she will. People will see this and say, hey, I should sit on a jury. Maybe I can get this kind of attention. Exactly. It's possible. Yeah. When I was moving from the District of Columbia to Massachusetts here, um, I was scheduled to be on a jury in D.C. And I wrote to them and I said, um, you know, I moved and they, I had to prove that I had moved. But it would have been interesting. As you know, from past discussions, I don't think highly of the jury system in the United States. I can't think of a better one, but there have been experiments around the country, small experiments in having essentially professional jurors. In other words, you, you'd have to want to do it. You'd have to demonstrate that you had some capacity uh, to understand what was going on, some familiarity with the, the law in general. So um, you know, a sum, what is a summary judgment? Summary judgment means you never even get to trial. You never get to trial. You you present the papers, you submit a motion for summary judgment. The judge looks at the case and says it's obvious one side is correct. The other side is wrong. I grant summary judgment to the defendant or the plaintiff. It's never used in criminal trials, but it's used a lot in civil trials. And some some week I'm going to talk about I have been sued and I'm going to talk about that lawsuit, but not tonight, because now we're talking about Emily Coors. I do think it, there is something amazing, and I think it's less important now than it was 20 years ago, where, as Nicole Kidman said famously in To Die For, that movie about her sexual relationship with a high school student and she oh, says at henry, one point, the buck henry buck henry yes great movie That's it was a great movie great movie where the kids kill yeah. her husband for her yeah it's um it was it was a great movie yeah and it uh but she says if you're not on television you don't exist yes and i've had people say that now everybody in theory, has a chance by doing something like inventing a new TikTok challenge and then they get on TV. But it was a big deal. And in part, it's a big deal when I started working in Washington because so few people were comfortable with even showing up on television. And I was happy to do that. And, um, you know, that that 
put me in uh, on too, too many cable shows too yeah. many days but so it's Let's not going to ruin it's not going to ruin the prosecution in georgia the 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 people who are defending rudy giuliani senator uh, senator from south carolina and others will raise this and say that this is a contaminated jury pool because they've heard about it. And it is occasionally is successful. I mean, when Oliver North was uh, testifying before Congress, he said a lot of things. And then when they were going to prosecute him, lots of people, including the ACLU, said you can't get this guy cannot get a fair trial. He can't get a fair trial because people might have heard something during the question and answers during the the House committee hearing and think that they knew it only because of what was going on in the criminal trial. And that was uh, that was not fair to North. And, and I, I do believe, think I believe uh, the special prosecutor was Walsh. Was that his name? That he was up. Uh, yeah, um, I don't remember his first name, but you're right about the last name. Joe Walsh. I Joe believe. Walsh. I, yeah, I, he played I, a mean guitar. Yeah, he was, uh, a, he was in Mountain, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah, I think he, he, with that other guy. I, what I but, think happened with Oliver North is his sentence got thrown out in, I think, an appeal because the Contragate Committee didn't coordinate with the independent counsel or spe- what I always confuse. It, it was no. special counsel. And I, I always confuse that, but they didn't uh, coordinate. And so some of the testimony Oliver North gave before the Contragate committee contaminated, according to the judge. Right. The, uh, the, the, the prosecution, yeah. which yeah, I think it was, it was a, contamination question and, and, I, uh, and North, I think the January you know, 6th committee I think they did a pretty brilliant job uh not contaminating Merrick Garland's uh investigation I think they did well I, I think they did too but remember we're in a, a judicial system that is nearly unrecognizable as an instrument of justice. And you never know, particularly in D.C., you have the D.C. Circuit, which is an appeals court that deals with all kinds of issues relating to government functions and is the likely venue of any kind of trial in the District of Columbia relating to January 6th. And you just never know the trial is almost certainly they're going to find a juror, a jury pool and a jury that will be happy uh, to find Donald Trump guilty of almost anything. But when it goes to appeal and it goes to this appeals court, it's, I think, now primarily uh, Trump appointees to the court on the D.C. Court of Appeals. Okay, and Fanny so, Fanny Willis. Yeah, she's she's okay. She's she she's not going to have any trouble with this. How out of line am I in thinking Donald Trump is never going to be tried because he's not a human being and he's from New York City. He's a real estate developer. He knows how to get things built in New York City, which requires manila envelopes filled with photographs of people. And if you're a prosecutor, a lawyer, and you go after Donald Trump, how am I wrong here? Okay, I'm Fannie Willis. I'm Rapsenberger, the secretary of state, who's not willing to play ball with him. Am I crazy to assume that anybody who challenges Donald Trump wakes up one morning underneath his door has been slipped a manila envelope. They open it up and they look at the pictures and say, I can't believe 
there's a picture of me doing this. I cannot believe it. And suddenly, you know, like Alvin Bragg, the newly elected Manhattan DA. Now, I'm not saying that there's compromise on him, but sure. he, he wakes up one morning and goes, you know, I don't think we can win. I don't think we have enough evidence here to do this. <laughs> how, how out of line am I? No, you're not completely out of line, but I really don't think that's going to happen. Because if it happened to prosecutors, um, I think there are enough people on the attorney general of Fulton County staff who would report it. And similarly with juries, because people try to tamper with juries all the time. I'll get to that in a minute. But um, I don't see that happening in Georgia. That's, because, blackmail. That's blackmail. It's, well, it's blackmail. Depends but, what you, it, it, let's say they had a picture of me and uh, Bob Dole. Right. Uh, standing next to each other. That would be you, you holding his, you holding his felt tip pen. I could be doing that. That would no. be wrong. In, well, in, I think in I did states, tell I this story, did I not? Um, when we were fighting draft registration, it was very important that people get conservative Republicans on board with this. And Mark Hatfield, who, except on abortion, was a, a total progressive uh, Republican, one of the last of the breed. So uh, he says to me, because I was running this big anti-draft coalition, he says to me, um, let's do a press conference together. I said, that would be wonderful. I'd be happy to do that. A few minutes later, I get a call from his chief of staff, Hatfield's chief of staff, saying, hey, we got great news. Bob Dole is going to be at the press conference with you and Mark. And I said, well, that's great. About 30 minutes later, he says, uh, what did you ever do to piss off Bob Dole? And I explained the thing. I won't get into the details, but it really screwed up Bob Dole's life and possibly cost him. Uh, I, I can't say it cost him the presidency, but it sure didn't help any. And. Mm -hmm. Here's the deal. So I, I explained this to the guy. I said, well, yeah, that it was an embarrassment to Bob Dole. I can't believe he's not going to do the press conference because I'm there. But why don't you call his staff back? Find out if you can work this out. So another half hour goes by. What happened? He calls me back. Hatfield's guy says, Bob Dole will appear. But there's one requirement. You and he cannot be in the same area so that you could be photographed together. <laughs> you know, uh, Bob Dole was a very petty man. He was a he never forgot a slight. And this was my, you know, my one experience of feeling that uh, completely. But he's. um Yeah. So uh, how did let's, I get diverted by that? Let's talk about uh, Alex Murder, my daughter. Yeah. Friends of mine. I can't talk. I'm watching the uh, I I saw that there's a Netflix special. I yeah. will watch it this weekend to catch up. Why is this story capturing everybody's imagination? Well, not unlike your comments about Donald Trump. Um, Alex Murdoch is a well-respected, was a well-respected figure in South Carolina. He is an attorney. Um, he's been accused and admitted today that he did steal money from his law firm. But here's what happened. So he's a, a hero. Nutshell. Yeah, he was a hero. Anybody and who steals money from a law firm, is that, do they do divorce? <laughs> hey, uh, I don't know. You're looking for a venue for... Uh, Another uh, one. Go ahead. OK, go ahead. OK, so from a family of lawyers, a family of lawyers, the town. well, well respected in South Carolina. Right. So he is is a his wife and one of his two sons were found murdered on June. So I think it's a June sometime in June 2021. So a couple of years ago. And uh, 
he has been a person of interest from prosecutors for a long time. But uh, only a year later was he actually prosecuted and they charged him with himself being the murderer. He has always denied that. And then today, the big news was he is, in fact, going to testify in his own defense, which is usually a very foolish thing to do. And I think it was in this case, too. He's. There's all kinds, there are two specials, actually. You'll probably want to binge watch both of them over the weekend. But, um, you know, he, he basically said, look, they were murdered near the dog kennels on my property. And uh, I, I, I wasn't even there. And he repeated that over and over and over again. I wasn't there. Well, <laughs> today he did admit for the first time that he was there and that his voice was, in fact, a voice heard on a little video taken by someone where there's a voice in the background. And he'd always said, that's not me. But today on the stand, when being questioned by his own defense counsel, he said, no, you know, I, I lied about it. I was there. But I didn't kill anyone. And his performance today, I thought, was terrible. That is to say, he is a lawyer, so he knows how to get sympathy, he thinks, from jurors. And he needs sympathy here because there's so but much evidence Apple, against him. He's an Apo baby. Right? Yes, he is. He is. So he how is. good a lawyer could he be? Well, he's uh, he's not that good a lawyer, probably. But, you know, and he had to steal money. so. He, he probably wasn't bringing in enough. A general so today, rule of thumb, when yep. you're hiring somebody, yep. maybe your accountant, your lawyer, a financial advisor, an Uber driver, yep. a, a masseuse, ask what did your father or mother do for a living if they were in the same business run? Exactly. Don't, don't That's go, a good thing. Don't go to a doctor whose parents were doctors. Don't go. Yep. Well, maybe that's that's different. And it's a little different. Yeah. Um, so he cries a lot on the stand. He he takes off this gla glasses that are constantly yeah. slipping down his nose right. and he's dabbing his eyes. And it's, it's it, it looked pathetic to me. OK, I, I have mean, a I question. Get, Here's the thing. Okay, go ahead. Professor Ann Lee is. One of the smartest people who's ever been born. Yep. And I know that she's watching the trial. One of my kids is obsessed with the trial. And tell me why I'm wrong. Okay. okay. I'm not good on spectator sports. There, there's there's a, a chunk of my brain missing. I can't enjoy the Super Bowl. And I don't enjoy watching trials like this. Because I say, and I said this to my kid, there, there's a war in Ukraine, there are homeless people, there's an eviction crisis, hundreds of thousands of Americans die each year because they're, they don't have enough health insurance or any health insurance. And I'm not, I apologize for asking this question. Why is this trial important is it news why is it worthy of our attention other than voyeurism it's not like he's a, a, it's not oh. kyle rittenhouse it's not like he's going to reveal well maybe because he comes well, from a rich family he can reveal the corruption in our justice system but is it's it really possible been? No, really that but, important but trial? In, interestingly, you bring up Kyle Rittenhouse and he was another defendant in a murder trial that did take the stand. And okay, he but why did, is that very question? effective? But answer my question. Why yeah. is this trial getting the coverage it, I feel it doesn't deserve? Isn't it a distraction? Am I, you know, no, I don't think it's a distraction. I, ju I do think this is not the most important judicial matter that you could be covering. 
But this is the kind of thing people watch. They watch it. And that's it's all about ratings. I mean, CNN did right, nothing but this trial for hours and hours in the morning and more hours in the afternoon. But, but is it good for this country for people to be? I, I'm surprised that you would find it interesting. Is it a soap opera? Is that what it is? No, I found it. Interesting to a point, but not obsessively so. Are in you words, interested watch... in it because other people are interested in it? Is that why you're? Well, because I don't have any. If I have to watch the news today, there's no news except the Murdoch trial. Right. Nothing. So were I inclined to watch television all day, I'd pretty much have to watch that if I was going to watch any network coverage of anything. OK, so the answer is, is turn off the TV, everybody. Could be. I mean, could if be. you don't, um, what am I missing? I, this, this, I'm not standing no. in judgment. I swear to you, I know I sound yeah. like I say to people, I wish I could watch this. I mm -hmm. wish I could go to a baseball game and enjoy it. I'm such a narcissist. What am I missing by not studying and learning about this trial? The only thing you're arguably losing is the ability when the trial is over to make an informed judgment of what you thought would and should have been happening during the trial, whatever it was that led to whatever result comes at the end, which I am 99% convinced will be the conviction of this character for the murder of both of both his wife and his son. But remember, he's trying desperately to get sympathy from that jury. So he does things like the crying, which, of course, Kyle Rittenhouse did, too. And then other things I noticed, he talked incessantly about his dogs and he also talked about his wife uh, and his son, Paul, with nicknames nicknames uh, expressing some affection which he's never used before the guy's done out oh, tens of hours of interviews with prosecutors he never used any name other than his wife's full name and uh his son paul's for for i think paul's name that he talked about today was um paul paul Paul, 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 before we go to the best movie of the past yeah. 20 years, last night, for some reason, I was reading Ted Sorensen's book written by John F. Kennedy, Profiles and Courage, which was written by his speech writer, Ted Sorensen. So but it was Jack Kennedy who got the Pulitzer or whatever. Jack Kennedy would have been a great late night talk show host, you know, not doing any of the writing, but getting the yeah. writing credit. It was Ted Sorensen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, oh, did you ever see Kennedy's Harvard application? Never. I love Never. Jack Kennedy. Yeah. I, do, I, I, you know, I think he's brilliant. I think he surrounded himself with fantastic speech writers. And. Uh, but his application for Harvard, he. Couldn't get into uh, DeVry uh, with that application. I mean, it's like, what is this guy? Uh, I won't say, I'll just say it rhymes with Harvard Yard. Uh, Harvard Yarded. What are you? Uh, so mm. I didn't know this. So I'm not being funny. I always thought there was a problem with the Nuremberg trials. And one of the profiles in Courage was. Robert Taft, the wow. Republican senator from Ohio, whose father was President Taft. And Robert Taft, Profile and Courage, the Profiles and Courage portrays all these politicians who took the high road and then paid a political price. Like Liz Cheney right. would be a Profile and Courage. Yep. So according to According to that definition. Right. Right. And but Robert Taft was against hanging 
the 10 defendants in the Nuremberg trial because he said, and I, I didn't know this until I read it last night, but it always, that it was an ex post facto law that they were being punished with, that they were put on trial for committing crimes that were essentially written after World War II and that it violated all international law, uh, killing these Nazis for crimes that were not illegal when they committed them. I thought that was kind of fascinating. And I guess he paid a bit of a political price. Right. But I don't and, know and enough given, about given, that. I really given don't. Joseph Kennedy's, given Jack Kennedy's father's uh, attitude towards the Nazis, I bet he commissioned yeah, that chapter yeah. in the book. <laughs> kind of interesting. What's the best? Yeah. Okay, here it is. We have to stay on. See, what's it, happening is we're rambling. <laughs> We are. We, we should be. And, and that story that you just told about Ted Sorensen and Ted <laughs> Thousand Curve. Uh, yeah. yeah, you took a, you took a liberty. It, it was a, um, okay. Best okay. movie in the past 20 years. I thought that there are two great movies we had seen. Women Talking, which is an excellent film. Oh, in and the I, movie? It, like you were trying to watch it and these women were talking? No. That's that's another story. Okay, that's the story of my life. And I thought I thought that was a great movie. This what is one, women talk. What is that? Women talking is about a kind of an occultic religious movement where the men where men have come in and raped women, and the women finally get together and talk about what they should do. Should they leave or should they stay? And that's all I can say about it. But mm. then we saw the whale, the whale, and the now, whale. Twenty years ago, ago. twenty <laughs> years ago, well, you saw Moby Dick in nineteen fifty-six. I was more than twenty years ago. No, twenty years oh. ago, I would have made a Chris Christie joke. <laughs> yeah, or, but you know, Ali, uh, what's her name? Christie Alley is a repo- was a Republican. She so was yeah. gone with her. Can't do that anymore. No, you can't. And it's you wrong. Shouldn't. You shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. No. No. Anyway, this is like a Chekhov play that is being filmed. It only has a few, like four serious actors and actresses in it, but it's astonishing. It's called it The is Whale. A story called The Whale it's with Brendan Fraser, who's mainly known to people for being a uh, Let's see. Uh, oh, he, he was play, an Encino man, and does he play? Of a, a, does he play a, a obese human being in this? Yes, he does. Right. A very, He's, very obese person. Right. Okay. And but the sub stories and the relationships, I thought, was absolutely brilliant. It is based on a play. I don't know if it ever was on Broadway, but uh, it was. Uh, Brilliant. It's just as good as what Stephen Gilbert Grape. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That not even Gilbert's Grape is not even close to this. Okay. It's called The Whale. The Whale. And where can we see it? Well, you can't. And I'm glad you asked. Um, We saw it in a movie theater, but you can now watch it streaming for, I think, 20 bucks on uh, a number of pay channels and cocaine bear that's coming i definitely want to see it greatest trailer oh it's a great tra- <laughs> trailer it's like i like why see the movie it's you, can, you cannot see as good as no. the trailer i think they did a disservice to the movie because i'm watching it thinking well i've seen everything that needs to be anything from this Mm-hmm. after this is going to be a disappointment yeah well lo- the los angeles times said is this a movie so bad that it's no. good no and it says no it says okay. no it's not that good it's not so bad that it's good it's just bad then then it means it's really good yeah if you don't like the Los Angeles Times film critic, uh, Justin Long, I think is his name, is my favorite 
movie reviewer of all time. He gave a raving, a rave review to women talking. And I never read reviews until after I see the movie. I'm not interested in what somebody thinks. I've been informed that Justin Long is an actor. He's an actor. He was the Apple guy. Justin Long. Remember those? I'm an Apple. No, I, John, I, I, Judge Hodgman. John Hodgman was a oh, PC. Yeah, yeah. That was before yeah, you were born. The Reverend Barry yeah, yeah, W. Okay. Lynn. We should do a screening of Cocaine Bear at office hours. That I, if it's not going to last long in the theater, theaters, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn for nearly a quarter of a century ran Americans United for separation of church and state. He is a lawyer and an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. His book comes out April Fool's Day. The three P's. What's it called? Paid to piss people off. Volume one is about peace. Number two, about porn. And number three, about prayers. And I did some woman that wants to review the book wrote and I, she said she wanted to get the PDF uh, more or less final version. And I said, you know, I was thinking of changing because it is a trilogy. It's three books and it. Most people seem to be buying pre-sales of all three. And uh, I said, I was going to call it Lord of the Rings. But then I found out somebody else had written a trilogy with that name. Who? That's weird. I, I don't, it's weird. It's Lord some guy I never heard but not, of. But not the Lord. You're talking about the Lord. <laughs> the Lord. I'm the talking Lord. about the Lord. The Lord of Henry. Listen. Um, I'm going to buy. Uh, no, is, yeah, how do yeah, I buy the book? You, well, you you go to um, uh, you go to your. uh Whatever Joe in Norway sets up. Um, you see, I don't, it, it's in the chat room. OK, well, we'll talk every, next, all we, kind we, of information. We have six it. weeks. Oh, before. OK, OK. We'll stay do. out of trouble. Only right. good trouble. Thank you. Thank you.